Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, so I am filling in for uh, Pastor Jonathan today. He and Bethany are out celebrating their anniversary. And so we are very excited for them as they get to do that. And please join me in prayer for them uh, throughout the next couple of days as they prepare to travel back, that they'll have safe travels uh, and, and get back safe. Uh, so today we're going to be continuing in our Summer on the Mount series. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be starting in verse 38. So over the past several weeks, as we have been doing this series, we have been walking through Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things that you might have noticed if you've been here is what Jesus is doing is he is shaking things up in the religious community. Because he is taking laws that the Jewish people have known for generations and interpretations and understandings, and what he is doing is he is saying, hey, here's how you've gotten this wrong, here's what it actually means to follow this, and here's what your life should look like. And so today we're going to do the same thing, because Jesus is going to be talking about uh, our, understa our understandings of justice and fairness. And how we want to respond when we feel like we have been treated unjustly or unfairly. A couple years ago, Ellie and I, when we moved to Austin uh, for me to take this job, her cousin and her cousin's family had also moved to Austin about the same time. And so we invited them over. And so they come over. And now here's what I have to explain about the situation. That Ellie and I, we had two dogs. Okay, I have a dog... He's not no longer with us, but Dirk, who was our German shepherd, who was this big, massive, goofy German shepherd. And then we had Boaz, who was, as we still have him today, as a mutt, and is about 55 pounds. So we have two big dogs. Now, my cousin's family, they had two small boys, and the small boys had not encountered dogs very much, and there was a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of fear about meeting the dogs. And the problem is, our dogs, if I'm being honest with you, we're not super well trained. Okay, so Boaz is what I like to call a close sniffer. And here's what I mean by that. Boaz would never lick you. If he does, you probably have food on you. But what he will do is he will get uncomfortably close to you and sniff you. If you ever had someone in your life try to annoy you by putting their hand right here and saying, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, that is Boaz. But he's gonna sniff out your soul and figure out what kind of person you are. Dirk, on the other hand is a kisser, all right? He is going to walk up. He is going to lick you in the face, whether you want it or not, all right? He had a giraffe tongue. That thing would find you around corners. You think you're safe, and it gets you, okay? So we know this going into it, and so we greet them. The dogs are up, and then the boys come and sit on the couch. The parents are sitting on either side. I'm like, we're going to do our best to make this a very pain, painless process where the boys can greet on their own time. So we open the door with the dogs out, and almost immediately, Boaz jumps in between the children and the parents and is just right here in the boy's face, just sniffing very closely. There's already some uneasiness. Dirk makes the rounds, and then he goes by, and he catches the youngest boy smack dab in the middle of the face with just a giant kiss, like just a lick right up the face. And it's one of my favorite responses I've ever heard in my entire life because he immediately starts to scream, it's not fair! And he is just yelling, it's not fair, because an injustice has been done. He's having an existential crisis at this point. He's questioning how a loving God could allow suffering in the world, right? I mean, it is one of these things that has shaken him to, a core, to his core. And it's a silly story, but I tell it to communicate this point, that all of us, from the time that we are very young, because we have been created in the image of God, have inherited a sense of justice, a sense of fairness, and a sense of what is right and what is wrong, right? It is a good thing. God is a God of justice, and so we're meant to know these things. But the problem is we're fallen people. And so while we'll be able to identify what right and wrong is, and we'll be able to tell what's fair and what's unfair, the issue that comes into our lives is whenever we decide how we are going to handle anybody who treats us unjustly or anybody who treats us in a way that we do not enjoy or who insults us. And what so often comes out of that is that we take it into our own hand and say, I'm going to handle this. I will deal out retribution. I will deal out vengeance. And I will make sure that things get even. And what Jesus is going to do today is going to challenge this and say, hey, 
you've been misunderstanding this teaching, so let's correct it and let me show you a better way. So we're going to start in verse 38. It says this, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall not love and hate your, you shall not, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, let's be honest. That is an incredibly challenging piece of Scripture. And not necessarily because it's hard to understand what Jesus is saying, but because it is incredibly hard to practically do what Jesus just commanded. Everything in us naturally wants to do the complete opposite of what Jesus just commanded. We will take care of it if someone insults us. We will get our vengeance. Like, I don't know about y'all, but if somebody insults me, my first response is not to be like, please, continue, right? It's not to offer them to keep doing it. No, I'm going to respond in anger and in frustration. But we have been called to something different. Now, the question would come up, well, why is Jesus talking about this? Why is he dealing with this issue? I think there's a couple of reasons that we need to look at. And the first one is this, is that truthfully, the law was being mishandled, mistreated, and misused. And so Jesus is going to speak truth into that. And we're going to cover that in more detail here in just a moment. I think you can also look at what does our typical response bring about in relationships? And also, are we bringing glory to God's name in our response, and does our life look any different from the world around us? James, 1, 9, James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says this, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So our anger, our response, our retribution does not bring glory to God's name. It does not achieve the righteousness of God. It looks exactly like the rest of the world does. And if you're being honest, for those of us who have always handled things on our own, let me ask you a question. Is there a lot of peace in your relationships? You see, oftentimes we'll handle it, and it might make us feel better in a moment and make us feel vindicated, like we've gotten our hit back, but at the end of the day, there's a better way and something else that we have been called to. And so that's what Jesus is going to deal with. And now listen, this is an extremely challenging thing to do. This is a hard passage of Scripture because we really don't want to do the things that God's called us to. However, what I've tried to do in this sermon will hopefully communicate well to you is that I believe there are three traits that Jesus identifies in the text and that he calls us to. And the first one is this. This is our first point, that we are called to be humble. So if you look back at the text, you look in verse 38, it says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, that's incredibly easy to understand right? Every, pretty much every religious system that exists in the world, pretty much every justice system that exists in the world has a teaching that is similar to this. It's not hard to understand. You poke me in the eye, I poke you in the eye. You chip my tooth, I'm going to chip your tooth. It makes sense. It's logical. And this verse was given in Exodus chapter 21, verse 24, and it was given by God. It is a good law. It is a just law. So what is Jesus trying to correct? There were two things that were being mishandled about this verse in the synagogues and with the religious leaders. The first is this, that they were taking a commandment and a law of God that was given in the civil context, and they were applying it to personal relationships. So here's what I mean by that. If you go back and you look at Exodus chapter 21, and you read through it, and you see the context, the law is being given to a judge, 
Now, the judge is who would rule over disputes and disagreements in between people who brought their cases to them. So much like we have judges in our system today, it was a civil issue. But what had happened is that somewhere along the way, they had taken that out of the civil context, and this is how it should rule in the law, and they had taken it into personal relationships. So now, if you wrong me, it's not that we're supposed to go before a judge, and a judge is going to mediate, mediate this fairly. Instead, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to return fire. The problem with humans, though, is that often our response is not an eye for an eye. Our response is, you poke me in the eye, I'm going to poke you in both of your eyes. Okay, you strike me, I'm going to strike you and kick you. All right? You do this to me, I'm going to do this back to you, and then I'm going to return fire. Which brings us to the second issue. Is they had taken a law that was given as a limit, and they made it into an obligation. Okay, so the law was given so that the judge would know how to fairly rule in these cases. And it was given so that the punishment would not exceed the crime. Okay, it is an eye for an eye. It is not an eye for an arm and a leg. It is a tooth for a tooth, not a tooth for a life. Okay, so it was given as a limit so that people would not be unjustly punished. But what happened is, is we took it from a limit and we turned it into an obligation. So now if you wrong me, I am not only justified in responding, but I am morally obligated to return fire back to you to make sure that justice is handled fairly. What do you think that did to relationships? It's a never-ending response, and it creates enemies, it creates dysfunction, it creates all kinds of disorder amongst the people of God. And so Jesus is saying, hey, that's not what you're called to, you're called to something different. And then we get to verse 39, and it says this, But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now, this is one of, those, one of the most controversial ones in this entire text. Right? Because it says, if someone strikes you, do not respond, but instead turn the other cheek. And so it's important for us to understand this. The context that Jesus is talking about, what he is discussing here, is not necessarily a physical blow that is meant to cause harm to you. It is more of a deep personal insult. So it says a slap, it doesn't say a hit, and it emphasizes the right hand. The concept being, if I am a right-handed person, and I am going to slap you on the right side of your face, it is not going to be a wind-up hit, it's going to be more of a backhand. Okay, so the closest context I kind of think of, if you ever read much Shakespeare, have you seen kind of Old English, when somebody grabs a glove, and they slap somebody in the face and challenge them to a duel? That's the concept, that this is not a blow that's meant to cause you a lot of bodily harm, it is meant to be a deep, personal, embarrassing insult for you. What Jesus is not saying is that if someone comes at you with a bat, that you should just stick your jaw out there and take it. And then you should turn and let them hit you again. And that's a very important distinction. And also the first part of the verse says, do not resist an evil person. And this can also be misunderstood that Christians are supposed to meekly sit by and let evil and injustice rule in the world without saying anything. But if you keep reading in Scripture, you'll see that is absolutely not the case. We have been called to care for the marginalized. We have been called to take care of people who cannot take care of themselves and to defend them. Jesus himself, in just a few chapters, is going to go into the temple, and he is going to flip over tables and chase out evil and corrupt people with a whip, right? So Jesus himself confronted evil. And so we have to understand the context, that it's not about us not defending ourselves and not defending our family and not taking care of and confronting evil, but rather it's whenever somebody who is your enemy insults you on a personal level and treats you unfairly, that you are called to turn the other cheek. You are called to humble yourself in your response, to push down that need to be right, the need to be get yours, the need to get even, the need for vengeance, and instead to humble ourselves and not respond in anger. Okay, so that's the context that we're talking about. And if you go to verse 40 through 42, it says this, If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. 
Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, this right here is all about going above and beyond. So not only are we called not to respond in anger and not to return fire, we're actually called to be nice and generous and give more than has been asked. So in Jewish culture, if someone was to sue you, they could sue you and they could quite literally take the shirt off your back. But what they could not do is they could not take your coat. They could not leave you without any clothing. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, if you get sued and they take your shirt, go ahead and give them your coat too. They were occupied by the Romans, and according to Roman law, a Roman soldier could walk up to any Jewish citizen and make them carry their equipment or their pack up to but not exceeding one mile. Right? So I want you to imagine if we were a conquered country and someone could walk up to you from this conquering army and make you stop what you were doing and carry a pack for a mile. We would rebel against that and not be super excited. But what Jesus is saying, hey, if that happens to you, carry it too. Do not say no to people who want to borrow from you. Instead, be generous. That we are called not only to not respond, but to respond in an over-the-top way and to show love and care. And in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 17, what we'll see is, is that Paul himself talks about this idea. Give me just a second. I apologize. Can't find it in my notes, so we're going to actually just turn to Romans. But Paul talks about this concept and the importance of us responding with kindness whenever we are confronted by things that we do not want to respond with. So verse 17 says this, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, as so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this is the concept that we have been given, and it's a continuation of what Jesus' teachings are. That we are called to not only not respond in anger, in retaliation, but we're actually supposed to care for our enemy. We're supposed to give them food if they're hungry, give them a drink if they're thirsty. That we are supposed to go above and beyond and not to repay evil with evil, but instead to repay evil with good. Now, if that wasn't a complicated enough thing for us to try to do, Jesus is going to continue on in verse 44, where he says this. Excuse me, verse 43, where he says this. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, this second point right here is that we are called to love, right? We see this, and we see this call in our lives that we are called to love our enemy, now, the passage that Jesus is referencing here, it comes from Leviticus 19.18, which reads, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, you might have noticed something with Leviticus 19.18 verses verse 43. Because the, the saying that Jesus brought up was, love your, enem love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Nowhere in Leviticus 19.18 does it mention hating your enemy. It doesn't say it in there. There is not a law that you will find in Scripture that says hate your enemy. But what had happened is, over time, this teaching had changed and it had morphed to where now the command was not don't hold a grudge, don't bring out vengeance, love your neighbor. That was love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And notice what that does is they have taken the idea of hating your enemy and they have put it on the same level as loving your neighbor. So both of these are commands from God that you are required to do. You have to love your neighbor and you have to hate your enemy. And Jesus is like, no, that's not what this says. That's not what it should be. Instead, I'm going to give you verse 44, which says this, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So we've gone from love your neighbor, hate your enemy, to love your enemies. So why was that changed? It was changed because our natural human response is to love the people who love us, to like the people who like us, and to hate the people who hate us. 
In fact, if you just take a second and you think about the world that we currently live in and where we are currently at in our country, we live in a time of deep hatred and animosity for anybody who disagrees with you, right? That our country has lost the ability to respectfully disagree and to have different views and have a different vision for how things should be run. And instead, we have gotten to the point where if you do not agree with me in my faith, if you do not agree with me in my political leanings, if you do not agree with me on my views on social issues, you are wicked and evil, and I hate you. And now most of us in this room would probably not use the word hate, because if you're like me and grew up in a church, you're never told never to say the word hate. It's too strong of a word. But in action and in deed, we will hate people who disagree with us. Because as a society, we have done everything in our power to find ways to divide people up into different groups, whether it be by faith, whether it be by race, whether it be by sexual orientation, whether it be by political party, whatever it may be. And what happens is if there is somebody who doesn't fall in my category, it is easy to dehumanize and to hate that person and to view them as less than and to want bad things for them. Right? That's the natural thing. But we, as believers, are called to love. Now, I want to be very clear, because I don't want this to be a misunderstanding. There is very real evil happening in our country. And not just happening, being pushed and being politicized that this is a good and loving thing. Where we are trying to our best to confuse children about what gender they actually are that we are pushing surgeries that will forever alter and maim a child's body in the name of progress and love, that there are, there are states who are okay with abortions up to nine months because it's a woman's choice, right? There is evil that is happening in this country, and Christians, we should publicly and proudly be standing firm on what the word of God says, and we should be speaking out against evil that is happening. And when it comes to voting, we should be voting based on biblical principles and things that we see in scripture. But what has happened, and I know it happens because it happens to me as well, is that when we see people who we so vehemently disagree with, that instead of responding in love and grace and mercy while speaking truth, we respond in anger. Okay, one of my biggest weaknesses is I love comment sections on social media. I do. I love to read through them, and I shouldn't because it just makes me angry. So I'm like, how can you be allowed to type things? All right, because there's no way you can be a real person and believe this stuff. I can't tell you how many messages I have typed and had to go back and delete because it brings out these things in us. But we are called to something better. So speak true, stand up against evil, stand firm in what you believe in, but do it from a place of love and humility while seeking the best for the person that you are going against, right? That we pray for them. And I want to be very clear on his, because there's a country song that talks about I'll pray for you, but it's I'll pray that bad things happen to you, right? The idea is you're praying for their benefit, that God would bless them, that God would redeem them, that God would restore them and bring them into a right relationship with him. That's what we have been called to do. Now, another, where, another place where this gets confused is a lot of times, much like turning the other cheek, is we can take it out of its proper context and we can apply it into things it does not actually belong in. So what I mean by that is we'll say, okay, I'm supposed to love my enemy. So that means that I am supposed to just kind of let them do whatever they want. I'm supposed to say yes to things. I'm not supposed to be resistant. I'm not supposed to speak truth into their life. I'm supposed to kind of let them do their thing. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do to someone is say no. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for someone is to deny your presence. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for somebody is to speak in grace and in humility truth into their life. So every sermon I preach, I talk about my son, but in my defense, he's very applicable. So I have a one-and-a-half-year-old son at home. Now, he does not have the greatest perspective on things. Okay, so as a child, he tries to put everything in his mouth. He puts himself in dangerous situations, and he does things that I know as his father, this is not going to be good for you, this is going to be dangerous. And so as his father, what do I do? I take the dangerous thing out of his mouth, I move him away from the dangerous situation, and I try to make sure that he's okay. But here's the deal. In that moment, my son does not look at me and think, wow, you're being so loving. No, he thinks, why are you being mean to me? 
Why are you so cruel? Because sometimes love can be mistaken for cruelty by somebody who is struggling with something, right? But that doesn't change my requirement and my desire as a father to see what is best for my son. And so I am willing to let my son be upset with me. I am willing for my son to be upset because ultimately I know it's going to lead to lead to the best things for him. And in the same way in our lives, we have been called to love our enemies, that we have been called to seek what is best for them, that God would prosper them, that things would go well for them. And it requires a little bit of discernment on our part, right? Because we have to make sure that when we respond in these situations, are we responding because we believe through the Spirit that this is what is ultimately best for them, or are we responding because I simply think this would be easiest or most convenient for me, or I want something bad for them, right? It's a matter of the heart, but part of love is figuring that out. And the second caveat I would get is this. Uh, sometimes, and there are people in this room, sadly, who you have people in your life who when I talk about enemies, it's not simply someone that you disagree with. It's not somebody who said something mean to you one time. It's not something like that. That there are some of you in this room who have suffered very real abuse, assault, neglect, and truly terrible things in your life. And that your enemies caused unspeakable pain and suffering to you. So how do we respond in those situations? And I think it's so important to notice something in the text. At no point does Jesus talk about what they're doing or how you personally feel. He says, it's what you're called to, to love. But here's what I'll say. You can love someone, and you can pray for someone, and you can forgive someone without continuously putting yourself in a bad situation. This is one of those things in Christianity that is often manipulated and it is used by people who abuse to try to keep people locked into a system of abuse because, well, no, 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 you're supposed to love me so you can't leave. You're supposed to forgive me so you have to open yourself up to this. You can love someone from a distance, right? So if you're in a situation where abuse is happening and someone is consistently wronging you and consistently taking advantage of you and doing bad things to you, then you need to remove yourself from that situation. You can love and pray for them, but don't keep exposing yourself to abuse, right? I think that's a very important thing to throw in there because a lot of times that's misunderstood. But we are called to love our enemies in the same way that God loves us, and this brings us to our third and final point, which is this, that we are called to be an imitator of God. So if you go to verse 45, you'll see this, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now that first part, it says to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now, is this passage saying that in order to be a Christian, you've got to turn the other cheek and you've got to love your enemies? Well, here's the deal. We're saved by grace through faith, not by works. So it can't be saying that you have to do this in order to be saved. But rather what it is, this is a common expression used in that time, that if you were to say you are a son of, it means that you are sharing in the characteristics of. Okay, so the idea here by saying that you are a son of God is saying that you are sharing in the characteristics of God and your ability to love your enemies, right? And then if you go down, it talks about right after that, it mentions that he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, what does that mean? Uh, there's a very real human condition that comes up sometimes where whenever we're going through a hard time, we might look at somebody else who we would look at and say, that person is lost as the day is long. They are sinners, they are wicked. But yet for some reason, I am suffering and they are prospering. For some reason, even though I am a follower of God, this person is being allowed to have power, they are being allowed to have wealth, they are being allowed to have success. God, why have you not taken them down yet? In fact, in, uh, in Bible study, just in this last hour, the youth were going over Jeremiah chapter 12, and in the first five verses of Jeremiah chapter 12 is Jeremiah basically asking God the same thing. Like, God, have you not noticed all of this wickedness? Why are you allowing it to happen? But that verse says that God allows the sun to rise and the rains to fall on the just and the unjust, on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So it is a reminder to us that God is in control. 
that God knows who is wicked, God knows who is righteous, but thank God for us that God does not dole out retribution the second that we consider someone to be evil. So if you go to Romans chapter 5, we're not going to turn there, but one of the things that you'll see in Scripture is that Scripture would say that you and I were enemies of God whenever he sent his son to die on a cross. And then in Romans chapter 8, we see that you and I are hostile to God. So at one time, us as believers, even though we were enemies of God, even though we were hostile to God, God still sent his son to die on a cross for our sins so that we could be restored. So we would look and say, God, why have you not rectified this? Why have you not destroyed the evil people? But we were one of those people once upon a time. And 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as we understand slowness. He is patient, wanting no one to perish, but everyone to have everlasting life. So we have been called to love those people that we would deem as wicked. And that we are to love the people who we would love for God to smite and we would love for God to take down. And if you continue on in verse 46, it says this, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Incredibly easy to understand. If our lives are called to be different, if we are to say that my, I have been changed by the grace of Jesus Christ, I am a follower of Jesus, and then I only love the people who are kind to me and who love me, and I hate the people who have wronged me and the people who do not like me and who I do not like, how am I any different? And he gives the indication of a tax collector. Now, a tax collector would have been seen as the chief of sinners, right? They were Jewish people who had sold out their own countrymen and paid for the right to collect taxes on behalf of the Roman government, right? So they were actually paying money so that they could come to their own countrymen for the oppressors and take your money to give to the oppressors. And not only that, most of them were wicked and would take more from you than what it actually was. Like we didn't have an IRS that gave you a tax return that told you here's how much you owed. They kind of made it up, right? And so they were considered the worst of the worst. And God's like, hey, even the worst sinners do this. You're called to look different. You're called to be different. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So we have been called to act and respond differently from the rest of the world. We have been called to love those who persecute us. We have been called to seek what is best for those who are evil. And we have been called to take care of our enemies. And if that wasn't hard enough, we'll do our last verse in verse 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So just a small thing, right? That you and I, on top of all the other things that we struggle with, we have now been told you are to be perfect as God is perfect. Now, you might notice a problem with that. None of us are ever going to be perfect. None of us are ever going to perfectly fulfill the law. We are not going to be perfectly loving. We are not going to be perfectly kind. We will have days and times where we respond in anger and frustration, and we do not give the grace that we are supposed to give. There are going to be times where we are going to take retribution and vengeance into our own hands, and we are not going to repay evil with good. We are going to repay evil with evil. But here's the beauty of our faith, that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled the law, that Jesus Christ was perfect as our Father is perfect, and that he died on a cross for our sins so that you and I might be rescued and redeemed and restored into a right relationship with God, not because we are perfect, not because we are great, but because God is simply good. However, we have to be careful that we do not let our knowledge that we cannot be perfect give us an excuse not to do the things that God has called us to do. We are still called to love our enemies, even though we're going to screw up sometimes. We're still called to show grace and mercy, even though sometimes we're going to be far from graceful or merciful. This is a pursuit. It is an obedience to God that we have been called to. One last thought, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, one of the things that I think sometimes hampers our ability to have 
this ability to actually show grace and compassion and empathy to the people around us is most of us operate from a very limited perspective. And here's what I mean by that. We view everything through the lens of how we see the world, which makes sense because it's the only lens you can really see things through. And the interesting thing about us is that when it comes to us personally, we are kings and queens of understanding nuance, right? We understand why we act the way we do. I was having a bad day today, so that's why I was rude to my wife. Or you know what, I have this going on, it's a stressful time in my life, and so I didn't handle that situation with as much grace as I should have. And we will give reason after reason and excuse after excuse as to why we fall short, but whenever somebody else dares to offend us, our response is, how dare you? Our response is not, hey, what's going on in their life? Is there a reason why they're acting that way? But rather, it is an immediate, how could they? Now, there's a quote from Plato that I've always loved, and it says this, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. And it's a reminder that maybe there's a reason why people are acting the way that they are, because every single person in this world is a human being who struggles, has issues, has pain, and has hurt. And one of the things that I have learned in my time in student ministry, that oftentimes the most difficult kid that I have to deal with the most difficult kids that are always disrupting, they're not paying attention, they're causing all kinds of issues, are often the kids who have been hurt the most and they have the most need for the love and affection that they are so aggressively seeking. And they're doing it because something has happened in their life. Now, here's the deal. Is that an excuse for people to treat you terribly? Absolutely not. No. But you can't control other people. Right? I don't have the ability to, to fix other people's issues and make everything in their life be great and have them treat me exactly how I want to be treated. I have zero control over that. But here's what I can do. I can do what 1 Peter 4, 8 says. It says, above all else, love each other with a fervent love because love covers a multitude of sins. So no, I cannot control other people. I can't control how they act. I can't control how they're going to respond to me or what they're going to do. But what I absolutely can seek to control is how I respond to them. And that I can seek with all of my heart in the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of his name to love them fiercely, even if they're my enemy.